You may be seated. If you do not have an outline, I want to encourage you to lift your hand for just a moment, and some of these guys will be glad to give you one. In our church, we study the Bible. We study the Bible verse by verse. Uh, we have an outline for you so that you can not only pay attention now. How many of you think that you're a little bit ADD? How many people are you know you're ADD? <laughs> how many of you know that I'm ADD? Does anybody, yeah, okay, a bunch of you know I'm ADD. The bottom line is, um, it is my passion that we would hear God's voice, and it, was my, it is my passion that we would study His Word, and that we would hear Him in His Word. And that's why we have an outline, that's why we have PowerPoint, that's why we encourage you to be able to go home and study where we are. You notice that we're in message 27. Um, of this little book of James. So if you're new to us, you say, well, these people are slow. And you can say, yes, that's right. Takes us um, 27 um, sermons to get halfway through James. But we've been looking for the last two weeks or uh, over the, yes, last week and now this week at the issue of the tongue. Pastor James gives some tests where people can look at what he writes and determine to some degree whether or not they know God. He's concerned that people think that they know God and when they really have been self-deluded. And the tongue is one of the things that can reveal whether or not you're a Christian. I want us to see from James um, last week that we were looking at verses 1 through 12. If you don't have your Bible open, it'd probably be good for you to turn to James chapter um, 3 and verses 1 through 12. And then I want you to notice on our outline that we really springboarded from this particular verse, James 1.26, from a few months ago. If you would, would you read on the screen aloud with me James chapter 1 and verse 26. Are you ready? Let's read together. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is, is worthless. See, James is concerned that we may be self-deceived. James is concerned that we may think that we know God, but not realize that we have been deceived. And we can be very religious people. This was written to religious people. This is written to people who were going to synagogue in the name of Christ, just a few years after Christ would have ascended back to the Father in heaven. And yet there was the concern that they did not know God. Now, as James launches into the chapter 3 and goes through the issue of the tongue, I want you to see in your, in your uh, outline the square box that's there on the page, and you'll remember this a little bit from last week, where we looked at verse 5 where it says, so also the tongue is a small member, talking about a small member of the body, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest, for, or how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, just a spark starts a forest fire. Now circle the number six there because that's the verse that we're going to study this morning. We're going to hang out in verse six. It's a hard verse. It's a difficult verse, but it's one that we need. Listen to this, church family. It's one that we need before we come to the table of the Lord. And it's one that we need before we live another day. Because we need to realize where the problems of the tongue really originate. And verse 6 is going to show us that. Look at verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It's one of the most expressive phrases in the New Testament. That, that, that is packed with exclamation. A world, you, you could almost say a universe, a cosmos of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. We're going to look at what does that mean, the course of life. 
and set on fire by hell. Verse 7, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, and underline it, full of deadly poison. So this, this issue of the tongue as we look at it last week, you remember a few of these, and when we do the review, allow this to, to allow what we studied last week. There's two reasons we do the review. Number one, for those that are here to remember what we said last week because of the way we study, we study from verse to verse to verse to verse, or section to section to section. This, this all collates together. It all is together. But also, it's for those that are new to us this morning or that missed a Sunday, this helps you know where we've been, and it helps this message be in context. So last week, we said, number one, the tongue refers to our words. It's not really talking about the flesh in our mouth so much as it's talking about what, the, what, that, what that ability does. It, 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 that tongue has the ability to express words, and words mean things. You remember we said words mean things, and they have consequences. Ideas and thoughts actually have consequences. They impact our lives. Number two, the tongue reveals our heart. The tongue reveals our heart. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, that the tongue speaks out of the abundance of the heart. You may want to make that little note out there to the side. The tongue speaks out of the abundance of the heart, out of the overflow of the heart. So whenever you hear someone speak, you can know that you're hearing what's in their heart. I remember the stories of Billy Graham being close to Richard Nixon. And you remember Richard Nixon ran into some legal trouble, didn't he? Called Watergate. And years later, when the Watergate audio tapes were finally released, they had recorded conversations in the the Oval Office and in the White House, and when those were finally released, the good friend of, of Richard Nixon, Billy Graham, they had been friends, they had talked about faith before, they had shared about relationship with Christ, his Puritan background of growing up in California, Richard Nixon. And so there, the, he was a, a welcome guest. Billy Cram was a welcome guest at the White House and when he was um, uh, in other places of position. But when Billy Graham heard the White House tapes, he excused himself and went to the bathroom and vomited. And it, and it wasn't so much because what was said was so grotesque, What was so treacherous of it was that Billy Graham said that he had been so deceived about the heart of his friend, Richard Nixon. He said, because you see, the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. And Billy said, I was so disappointed that that what I thought, what sounded like genuine faith, what looked like that on the outside was revealed to show a wicked heart. So our tongue reveals our heart, Matthew 12, 34. Number three, the tongue is the vehicle of many different sins. There's many different ways in which we sin against God with our tongue. There's many different ways in which our words bring about the sin that Christ died for. And we, we recognize that it's, the emphasis is on words, and because of that, number four, the tongue is equal to our, do you remember what we said? Our fingertips. In this day and time, we need to recognize that the, that the e- also that the emails we write, the blogs we write, the Facebook that we write, the, the Twitter comments that we make, the Instagram, and all other things that come through our electronic media, media are an extension of our tongue and they reveal our heart. Number five, the text that we saw last week said that the tongue is very small, but it's very powerful. You remember there were three examples given. Do you remember what those three examples were? 
a horse, a ship, and a fire. Now, what was the pit about the horse? The, 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 the issue of the horse was the bit in his mouth is so tiny, yet this powerful animal, animal is guided by it. And that's how our tongue is. Our, our life is very often guided by what comes out of our mouth. It determines much of who we are. And these massive ships that can take cargo across the world, and, and here they are guided by this tiny little rudder at the stern of the ship. And the direction of the ship goes. The ship can navigate all around continents and through islands and around icebergs, hopefully. And, and the whole picture of it by this one little thing at the stern of the boat. And I was doing some study about rudders. Do you know that a rudder typically is 1% to 2% of the overall surface area of the ship? Only 1% to 2%, and yet it guides the ship in where it's going. It's so small, but it's so powerful. Notice this as well. We said, number six, that the sins of the tongue are very easy to commit, and they're difficult to quit. The sins of the tongue are so easy. It, you, you don't have to work hard to sin with your tongue. In fact, very often you sin with your tongue and you're going, hey, boom, 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 boom. And, and you wish you could pull it back, right? You, you don't even have to really think to sin with your tongue, do you? You don't have to plan to sin with your tongue. In fact, most of the time it's when we're not thinking very much, right, that the, the sin of our heart comes out. And very often, it's, it's not when we're trying and orchestrating in order to sin and scheming in order to sin. We, we simply do it. It just kind of, we emote or, or the truth of how we think about something is simply revealed. And so we come to this where we see that they're easy to commit and they're very often hard to quit. Number seven, a sinful tongue reveals gross inconsistency with true saving faith. That's what a sinful tongue does. A sinful tongue reveals gross inconsistency with saving faith, and that's verses 9 through 12. And then we've also recognized that there's a tension between what is and what ought to be. We, we are, we're tempted to look at this and say, well, we, we, we recognize what comes out of our mouth, but, but that ought not happen. And we saw that at the end of the passage in verse 10. And here's a concept that we're going to deal with more, but notice this. True believers will possess a sanctified tongue. True believers will possess a sanctified tongue. But also look at the next part here. Yet they must maintain a sanctified tongue. And you say, well, isn't that saying the same thing? Well, not really. In fact, they appear to be in, in a collision with one another. They, they appear to be confused with one another. You see, when... We, we recognize that true Christianity is going to be revealed by, by a tongue that is, is not like the world's tongue, a tongue that is not like everyone and everything else. But yet, we have to work, and we have to deal with it. And we, we are told in this passage that it's untamable. So we're at a conflict here. Then we're, we're, we're saying, okay, we're, we're told that if you're saved, your, your tongue is going to reveal it, but if you let it go and, and if you're not careful, then your tongue does all of this evil. What do we do about that? Well, here's the big hint. You, you, you want to see that while will possess and must maintain our key parts of it, there is a beautiful picture, and we were just singing about it, that it's by the grace of God that we live out our Christianity. It's through his strength 
It's through his saving grace. So, hint, next Sunday, don't miss next Sunday. We're going to talk about how our tongue, if you have a propensity to lie, if you have a propensity to curse, if you have a pro propensity to lose your temper, if you have a propensity to say sexual things and, and innuendo, if you have a propensity to talk negatively about others and you're just kind of a, you, you kind of speak negatively behind people's back and you, and you kind of know you shouldn't do it and yet you can't stop, if you have a propensity to, to verbally abuse, if you have a propensity to, to be divisive, whatever, whatever those issues are, listen, next Sunday we're going to really talk about how we, we deal with that and how does, how does God deal with that to where we can do it. But this Sunday, today, we want to recognize the, the source of why this is so tough and why this is so difficult for us. Remember with me that Pastor James is making an evangelistic appeal and a discipling appeal. That's what he's doing. He's making two types of an appeal here. And one is, are you saved? And if you're not saved, you can be saved. And the second one is, if you are, if you are saved, are you living in a manner worthy? Of Christ. So, but this morning we focus on this verse 6, and it's recognizing the evil of a sinful, untamed tongue. Recognizing the evil of it. Romans 3 19 through 20 says this. Now we know, and it's right on your outline. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be what? Stopped. And the whole world may be what? Held accountable to God. Paul, in the first three chapters of the book of Romans, is exposing the reality of the law and our lawlessness. God's law, not the U.S. Constitution, not the European, not the Magna Carta, not the, not the laws of man, but the laws of God. And it's through the law that we see, number one, that God is holy, and number two, that we are not. That's the reason for the Ten Commandments, is so that we might see who God is and who we are not. And the, the law in itself is not going to save you. That, that God has called us to recognize who he is and who we are not and our need for him. Because no one can keep the law. No one can perfectly fulfill the law. There has to be a sacrifice that reveals that, that the sacrifice comes and it completes that which was broken. It heals that which was wounded. It brings to life that which was killed. Our sin is revealed through the law. And so, part of the picture is here, is that when we begin to realize who God is and His holiness, our mouths are stopped. We come to the place where we don't have an answer. Now, there's some who never come to a place of having their mouth stopped. Have you ever met somebody like that? And I'm not just talking about a talkative person. Part of what I'm speaking of here is that, that there are some who will never see and hear the law of God. They refuse. It's interesting that when someone is arguing against the gospel, and when they're, they're really struggling, they're, or they're struggling against the Holy Spirit working in their life, they may have a lot of words, and there might be, there might be a lot of protest, there might be a lot of argument against it, there might be a lot of resistance to it all, but what's very interesting is very often what, what we often see when God is working in someone's heart and drawing them to himself, that suddenly they become very quiet just before they realize this Savior died for me. You see, the, the law stops us 
Now, part of this, the, this subtitle that I've given is recognizing the evil of a sinful, tame, untamed tongue is, is very important. You know, I had a professor at seminary, at Mid-America Seminary um, in Memphis, Tennessee. I, I went there for a, a short period of time before going where I met Marcy at uh, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. But when I was at Mid-America, I remember that Dr. Gray used to say this. He would say this very often. He would say, young men, when you go to preach the gospel, when you go to pastor a church, when you go to work with people concerning what God wants, he said, you have to get them lost before you can get them saved. What did he mean by that? He meant that part of coming to God is recognizing, one, that you're not God. And number two, you're not like God. God is different than you. In fact, the way the Bible says that is that God is holy. He's set apart. He's not like the rest. And he's not just a little bit holy. He is completely holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We, we sing the great hymn, Holy, 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 that comes from the book of Revelation and the book of Isaiah. But this picture is, is that God is holy and we are not, and we have to recognize that. And if we, listen, if we are going to deal with our tongue, we have to recognize why our tongue is a problem. And really, when we're speaking of the tongue, we're also speaking of the heart. Because, you know, it is possible to sin without using words, right? There's a lot of things that you can sin without using words. It just so happens that the, the sins of the tongue, though, are very powerful, and they affect others in very powerful ways. And it, it is it's such an easy thing to do. And it's so very revealing on a continual basis of what is in our heart. Now, as I was thinking about this and, and thinking about this, this part of this message, I was thinking, of, it, it just occurred to me, what is step number one for anyone that is going through substance abuse program? like Alcoholics Anonymous. What is step number one for any one, any one of those programs? What is step one of a 12-step? You gotta admit you got a problem. If you won't admit that there is a problem, it, it, you can't keep going. It's gotta start there. You gotta be able to say, I got a problem. And that is where our relationship with God is, is, is really this picture of, of beginning to see who he is. And if we're going to move forward with who he is, he says, I'm holy and you are not. Will you recognize that? Now, there's a lot of people in our, our world today that they, they want to go to church and they want to be religious. They want to be spiritual. But man, when you start talking about sin and when you start talking about self and you start talking about a wicked heart and when you start talking about Satan and when you start talking about hell, they go, oh, I'm not into all of that. And don't, don't talk about the blood. That's kind of gross. And they really don't understand why the blood of Christ is a big deal. They don't really understand the picture. And part of the reason that they don't understand is because they don't see that they have the blood of Christ on their hands through their sins. Because Jesus died for our sins. And so we have to first recognize step one of this issue that we have a problem. Now, let me just tell you that a fool will never recognize he has a problem. A fool just simply cannot see that he's lacking. He cannot see that he's sinful. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. A fool has said in his heart, I'm fine. But it is wisdom who recognizes who God is and who we are and who he is in light of this. Now, 
Like all sin, fill this in down at the bottom of your page, like all sin, the impact of the tongue can be very near to us, and it can be very far away from us. Don't turn the sheet over. There's some more things for you to write there. I know you don't see blanks, but I just, I want you to, to, to keep up with me here a little bit. I want you to see that I start off on the left side of your page with family, and where does it end? Global, okay? You see, the sins of our tongue are both intensely personal, but yet the sins of our tongue can become global in scope. The sins of people, are, they do not only affect us, but they affect many others as well. Now, when we talk about family, I mean, how many of us have dealt with family issues that had a lot to do with things that were said? Not just things that were done, but very often things that were said. Very often are the most painful. And, and perhaps it is... It is a father or a mother who, as you were growing up, said to you something that, that just pierced you to the heart, and it, even today, it still defines you. There's many who have been told, you're stupid. You're dumb. I have a dear friend in this church where his father just said to him, he said, you're only good with your hands. You don't have a very good mind. That affected his life. Went through the rest of his life thinking he didn't have a very good mind until a point where he started to realize that wasn't true. In fact, this individual's brilliant. You see, we all have wounds of the tongue. And listen, we all have made wounds with our tongue. The tongue, as we've just read, is a deadly poison. The sinful tongue has the ability to come and set a fire that will burn down a forest. The sinful tongue has an ability to destroy a family. Words that after they're said, there's no way to take them back. I share with you this that my father told me about regret. He said he he was an only child. He went off to Georgia Tech from Miami. His dad was a barber. And his mom and dad sacrificed a lot so my dad could go to Georgia Tech. And he got up there at Tech, and and this was back in the early 1960s. And he was studying, and he was having a hard time. And just when he would talk on the phone once a week with his mom and dad, they could tell that something was wrong. They could tell that he was struggling. And at great sacrifice, my grandmother got on a bus. And she rode on a bus from Miami to Atlanta. And she showed up at the door. And back then, you know, you just didn't have all this communication all the time. And he didn't have an answering machine. He didn't have all of these things that would catch calls and miss calls. He didn't have a phone in his room. There was a knock at the door about 10 o'clock at night. And he opened the door, and there was my blessed grandmother saying, Clell, are you okay? And he just said, what are you doing here? And he, to this day, tears will well up in his eyes when he thinks about the regret of looking at her and cursing her with a lack of appreciation and care. You see, there's... There's poison in our tongues. And that poison comes from down within our hearts. Do you remember what we said last week? We've often heard people say, oh, he said that or she said that, but she didn't really mean it. No, the problem is she did. So what we often need to confess is not that we didn't mean it, but we need to confess that we did. And that we need the grace of God day by day as represented in the loving sacrifice of Christ. 
that helps us make it through. So there's the curse of words with family and friends that is so often there. What about in the life of the church? You see, our words, it can be doctrine or it can be division or divisiveness. You see, the the wrong words preached, the words omitted in preaching when the gospel is not clear and God's word is ignored. God takes that very personally when we ignore his word. And so when a church does not adhere and proclaim the gospel of Christ, clearly God is offended. And that's why we need the whole counsel of God's word. That's why we don't pick and choose. We don't say, well, we don't like the parts on hell, or we don't like the parts that point out the things that are our, our, our weaknesses. Or what about in the life of the church? There's many a church that have been destroyed by a divisive spirit and a divisive tongue. The Bible says that God loves when brothers dwell in harmony. How he loves it when they care for one another and build up one another and edify one another and protect one another and forgive one another and esteem one another is more important than themselves. You see, this is the way of Christ. And when our words don't do that, how many people have been wounded by a carnal church that doesn't preach the gospel or by a church that does preach the gospel, but they don't live it? How about this one? Societal and global nature of this. There's, there's, there's evil ideologies that come out of our words and we, we won't have time to go deeply into this, but I, I just want you to think about one evil ideology and think about the, the, the implications of it and what happened. Do you, do you know who this guy is? I want you to look at the screen and see this guy. Does anybody know who that is? Very good, Karl Marx. Well, Karl Marx was a German philosopher, economist, activist, lived from 1818 to 1883. And... You remember that he wrote this little thing when he was 30 years old? Do you remember what it's called? Communist Manifesto. I want you to think about the impact of Karl Marx upon the generations that were to come after him. You see, this reality of words and the fact that our words have meaning and these meanings have consequences range from one person's individual sin that affects a whole family of sin, or a whole church, or even a whole world. I think of this on February 21st, 1848. He published the Communist Manifesto, and it was a call to arms for a revolution to overthrow societies and governments by all means necessary in order to create a stateless utopian society in which all property is commonly owned and each person is paid according to his or her abilities and needs. It's rooted in atheism and materialism, not in belief in God. Well, do we realize what happened with Marxism as it grew up over the next 170 years till today? You know, we often remember the Nazi horrors. We often remember that six million Jews were, were gassed and put to death in Nazi Germany. But do we, do we go beyond just remembering Hitler? Do we go beyond to remembering the others? The hundred million people that were slaughtered as a result of Marxism? slaughtered, starved to death, as this wicked and evil ideology struggles to conquer the world. Think about this. Somewhere between 20 and 60 million deaths were in the Soviet Union. 40 to 70 million, we're not sure, but if it's only 40 million, is that only? 40 to 70 million in China, 2 million in the tiny country of Cambodia or Khmer Rouge, 1.6 million so far in northern Korea. 
1.2 million in Yugoslavia. And the slaughter continues today. You see, China's one world or one child policy is part of this. It led to the deaths so far of 336 million people. Thankfully, that has stopped. 336 million babies aborted in China. You see, we know about Hitler, but what about Lenin? What about Stalin? What about Mao? What about Pol Pot? What about Castro? Twice, listen to this, twice the number of people that died in World War I and World War II combined have died because of Marxism. What is my point? Our words can affect our own father, our own mother, our own daughter, our own son, our own lives in a very, very near to us facility. But our words can also affect people across the world and from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. And this this impact of our words is often a wicked and evil impact. Why? Because we're sinful human beings. I want you to see here, and you can flip your sheet over safely now. Look at verse 6. The tongue is a fire. It's in the box on the page. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. Number one, the sinful tongue is a destructive, terrorizing fire. The sinful tongue is a destructive, terrorizing fire. That's what it says in verse 6. The tongue is a fire. And it says a world of unrighteousness. Now, here, here's, this is an expressive statement. It, the picture is this. Anything that's unrighteous, the tongue has a part of it. The, it's, it's the whole world. It's anything that you can do wrong against God. The, the whole thing is there. It's, it's all involved in this. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, 27 through 28. Verse 27 says, A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a what? Scorching fire. A dishonest man spreads strife, And a, underline it, whisperer separates close friends. You see, these are sins of the tongue. These are sins that that come and they they bring about evil and they, they take good things and they make them bad. Proverbs 26, 22, or 20 through 22 says, For the lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no what? Whisperer, quarreling ceases. As charcoal is, as charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. The words of a whisperer are delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Now, here's part of what that means, is that When someone comes to begin to talk about someone else, it's interesting how down within our flesh is a desire to hear negative things. How many many news stories in the average news broadcast are good, positive, and uplifting? In fact, very often they have to resort to dealing with a pet in order to find good news, right? I mean, we, we, we rarely hear good news in our world. And, and, and I remember that one of my mentors, Tom Elliff, was just talking to me and we were talking about a news interview that, that one of the local places was asking for. And um, he said, Andrew, be careful. He said, just be careful. He said... What the news is really after is probably not going to be advantageous for you or the church. He said, just remember that if it smells, it sells. 
if it's rotten, there's interest. And that's how we as humans are. And this is why Christ died, is to rescue us from this. Look at the next one here, Romans 3, 12 through 14. It's about our sinful condition. It says, all have turned aside. Can you circle the word all? All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. There, and then look at where it goes. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Look, again, Romans 3. This is the picture of our depravity. We are completely depraved in our lost state. Somebody says, can you believe that preacher told me I am completely depraved? What kind of church is that? We just want to tell the truth. This is what God tells us. This is why we need a Savior. Jesus didn't die just because we weren't very pretty. Jesus died because we are hopelessly lost in our sin. So this picture is that not only is the Son, is the sinful tongue a destructive terrorizing fire but number two the sinful tongue is comprehensive in its fiery destruction it's it stains everything it burns it completely up how many times have you heard when somebody talked about a fire at a business or a fire in someone's home what 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 do we call it in insurance colvin other insurance guys what do we call it when it's what do we call it a a total what a total loss that's the picture of what the, of what the tongue does. It makes it a, a total loss. Completely burns it up. Look at verse 6. It says, the tongue is set among other, excuse me, the tongue is set among our members, staining what? The whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. Our, son, our sin in, our, in the tongue is part of that which taints all that we are. You remember the second sin that was ever committed was a sin of the tongue. And it was Adam looking at God saying, the woman you gave me told me to eat. Turning it back on God. You see our our sinful, comprehensive nature of this. Now, Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20, really reveal that it's, it's not our religiosity that is going to make us well or to make us good or, or even defile us. It's, it's the issue of our mouth. Look at chapter 10 or chapter 15 and verse 10. It says, and he called the people to him and they said to him, hear and understand. And he said to them, hear and understand. Look at verse 11. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what? What comes out of the mouth is what defiles a person. It's not... Now, what were they all hung up on? And this is really important for us to see. They were, they were all concerned about whether Jesus had washed his hands before he ate. That was the nature of their gripe. That Jesus, you don't keep the law. You didn't wash your hands properly. Hold them up. Let the water drip down in the proper way before you would eat. You're you're not eating kosher. You're not eating religiously. You're ignoring these laws. And Jesus is looking back at us saying, you think all of these laws are what are going to save you? You've not kept them. You can't keep them. Your religiosity, listen, you're going to Sheridan Hills Sunday after Sunday, and sitting through Pastor Andrew's long sermons, that, that's not going to save you. The, the picture is this. If we are looking to religiosity, if we are looking to the works of any man, we simply are lost and defiled. Look what Jesus says in this. He says in verse 11, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. This defiles a person. Verse 12, then disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard you say, when they're saying this? 
Verse 13, he answered them, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, who will fall into a pit? Both will fall into a pit. Verse 15, and Peter said to him, explain the parable, Jesus. In verse 16, he says, and he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from where? The heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Now don't tell your preschooler that yet. (laughs) We want them to wash their hands. But friends, if you think that being religious is what's going to save you, you've missed the entire point of the Bible. There is a Savior who died to do what you could never do. And that is why we, on a regular basis, stop what we're doing and recognize his sacrifice because we are so prone to forget. Notice here with me as we close on this. Jesus exposes the real problem of our sinful hearts. That's what he's exposing there. He's exposing the real problem of our sinful hearts. That's what he does. Number three, most horribly, the sinful tongue is ignited by Satan himself. And we see this in verse 6. Look at verse 6 again with me at the top of the page. It says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set against our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. So where does the fire, fire get started? It comes from hell. It comes from Satan. It comes from the deceiver. It comes from the father of lies. It comes from the one who rages against God. This is where lies come from. This is where sensuality comes from that distorts God's good things. Did you know, guys, did you know that sex is really good? No, I mean it's holy. It's good. God made it. And there's reasons that he made it. He made it so we could share in creation. He made it so that we can see what relationship and intimacy is all about. He made it so it would be right and good and holy and pure and beautiful and bring about great, beautiful results. And what does Satan do? With just, I mean, this is just a really good example that's in our society today that's so prevalent. Every, at every turn, he makes it about self instead of others. He makes it about all about the sensuality of the moment instead of the fast and beautiful meaning of what is there. He hates God's design. And so at the most base levels, whether it's about having Material possessions that can be a blessing from God. We, we get obsessed with them, whether it is about sexuality, whether it is about a family and various other things. We, we, we just are, are prone to distort it. And that all comes from Satan, who is the angel of light masquerading, seeking to deceive and he ignites it. And notice this, in verse 6 it says, and it is set on fire by hell. The word hell that is there is Gehana. Gehana is the picture of the valley of Hinnom. The valley of Hinnom is a valley right next to Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem, and right next to it there was a, there was a, a little valley, kind of a pit, 
And they would take all of their refuse there and they would burn it in that place. It would be all of their leftover foods. It would be the carcasses of the, of the you know, when they would uh, go ahead and, and dress a cow or dress a goat or whatever. It would be the entrails that are not used. It would be the other things. It would be all of the trash. The refuse would go out to this valley. And in order to keep the flies down and in order to keep the maggots down, they would, they would often keep people there burning it. And it would just smolder continually. It would smolder without stopping. It stayed going all the time. And it had been going for centuries and centuries and centuries by the time Jesus would come along and use it and speak of it. In fact, centuries before Jesus showed up, it was was the Philistines that would take their children and offer them offer their children in that place to the gods. And there were even some Israelites that got sucked into it because they weren't listening, they weren't being careful, staying close to what God had said. And in their times of deception, they went out sometimes too, and they did things that were very, very wrong. And here they would come and offer their children up in that place. So it was declared truly a forbidden, horrible, horrific, dirty place. And and because of the refuge that was there, there were worms and maggots that were there, and there was a fire that was there all of the time. And so when you look at the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus refers to this valley of Hinnom as where the, the, it's the, it's the picture of, of the hell that Satan is from. It's so that the people could understand that this is a, a fire that never dies. This is a place of refuse. This is a place that you don't want to be. And so, when James, the half-brother of Jesus, who's from Jerusalem, who knows that valley, talks about this. He says, where do all these evil things come from? They come from hell. They come from this great horror of refuse. So friends, we need to be very careful about what we bank our lives on? Do we bank our lives on the values of hell or do we bank our, our lives on the values of heaven? Be careful about listening to the world. Be careful about looking at the world. Be careful about loving the things of the world. Be careful about being obsessed. You know what, guys? Don't, don't be obsessed with somebody else's wife or some gal that you don't know. Be, be obsessed with the gift that God has given you in your own wife. Love and cherish her. Come to see what it means to be a man down faithful, down deep within God's design, saying this is what God has designed that is good. That a man and a woman learn to love each other. Women, don't compare your poor husband with everybody else. Leave the guy alone. (laughs) Love him like he is. Just learn to love each other. Learn to let the years come and fade your skin and wrinkle it, change your shape. Let let the years come and make you love one another that's not skin deep. Because this is the way of God. This is the way God loves us. So what, notice this at the bottom of your page, our ultimate desperation. This is what it is. We have desperation because we say, well, I can't control the tongue. The tongue has all this evil. The tongue is ignited by Satan. This is, I, I, know, I know what comes out. I mean, I don't curse anymore and I'm thankful for that, but what about all these other things that I struggle with? Maybe you say, I curse like a sailor and I don't know what to do. 
Well, we do what James says. He says, number one, are you saved? Don't come to this table. Don't come to the sacrifice of Christ without having given your whole heart to Christ and saying, Lord, save me. Place your trust in him and not yourself. You can't keep the law. But then we receive his grace in order to live in his ways. You see, our ultimate desperation leaves us looking to ultimate salvation. And ultimate salvation is what we must have. It does not begin in you. It does not begin in a godly family member. It's found in Christ. And so where does Thanksgiving come into this whole message? This is really a Thanksgiving message. I know it doesn't sound like it. (laughs) You have to see it in Psalm 103. Look at Psalm 103 and tell me if this doesn't set the tone for Thanksgiving in light of our hearts. Look what it says in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. In verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And here it is, verse 3. Who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases. Verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Do you have something to be thankful for? If you're a Christian, you have something to be thankful for, and it goes way beyond American heritage. I think Christians need to first celebrate the thankfulness to God that we have for salvation in Jesus. That is where true thanksgiving, because you can have a great country, you can have a great heritage, you can have a great story about the pilgrims and everything else, but if you lose your soul to hell, who cares? Oh, the glory of God's goodness to us in salvation. And Isaiah 118 makes it so clear. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, that means, that means deep red, blood guilty red. They shall be white as snow, though they are red like crimson. They shall become like wool. Now, in that day and time, there was no way to get a fabric truly white unless it was wool. They had various things that could turn wool white. And so here's the picture. Though you were blood guilty with blood on your hands and blood on your garments, Jesus went paying the price for your sins so that you can truly be clean, listen, even from sins of the tongue, even from the perversity of our hearts. And so today as we come to the table this morning, I want to encourage you. Take this tongue of yours Recognize it's a window to the heart and use it to confess to God your need for him. Say to him, Lord, I am a sinner. And Father, you are the one who gave your son for my sins that I might be clean. And today in your heart of hearts, do business with God remembering what he has done, placing your faith solely in Jesus.